Good morning. Uh, we are here on Thursday, March 4th, first of the uh, Fission uh, Weekly Thursday Tech Talks. Uh, I think James is voting for uh, that we should actually call this the Fission Audiovisual Experience, but we'll work on that. Um, uh, with us today, we've got Dylan Steck, uh, uh, creator of uh, Cortex. Um, he calls it tools for action as opposed to the popular tools for thought uh, that a lot of us are, are interested in these days. Um, I'll hand it over to Dylan to introduce himself and he'll give us a presentation and then a demo. Um, and please put your questions in the chat and away we go. Welcome, Dylan. Great. Thanks, Boris. Awesome. All right. Uh, do you see the slides up here? Awesome. Great. All right. So yeah, I'm Dylan. Uh, I am full stack developer. Um, 18, so still in high school at the tail end. Uh, I've been coding my whole life since I was, you know, nine or 10, toying around with websites. Humane tech advocate, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, Cortex, this tool for action that I'm building. Um, so I guess I would like to start with a little background of how I got into coding and this evolution of this project that I've really been working on for the past 10 years, if you distill it. So. I started coding when I was younger because I had always been fascinated in computers and I was tinkering with different blogs and I was always fascinated by something. When I was younger, I was always publishing, putting out content about sports I was into. Um, I even had a food blog at one point and I interviewed the CEO of Pop Chips and I was just putting content out there. But one day I discovered the customized CSS button in WordPress and that took me into a whole back realm of trying to customize my own themes, make my own websites. And then from there, I was doing online Code Academy courses and how to make your own website. And it just took me down this spiral at a young age of building. And what really fascinated me about the internet as someone who hadn't had as much prior experience was that you could be you know, a 10 year old sitting in your room, make a website, and you could convince someone online that you were you know, an older person working at a company and you had your own venture. And, and put your things out there and really legitimize the work that you wanted to do. And I thought that using computers, creating websites was an amazing avenue for me to just continue and share all of the passions that I was interested in. So as I was younger, I was looking for more and more ways to formalize on this knowledge. And I took two classes that really helped me. One was at this place, Flatiron School, where I learned about software development and Ruby you know, simple MVC, object-oriented programming, just some like basics of the trade that you don't really learn when you're just learning a markup language like HTML. And as I kept and kept building, I was just getting fascinated in the entrepreneurial process behind building and not more so I can make a tic-tac-toe uh, tic app or something, but you know, I can make a functional app where the user gets something out of it and it brings joy into their day or it helps you know, helps them stay more productive, stay more focused. And as I got more tools in my toolkit and I learned how to make apps with Swift and I learned a little bit more design and I learned a little bit more about how to pitch a product, I was starting to think more concretely about the actual problems that I wanted to solve. And as you can see here on the bottom, I was working on this app at the time called WebDeck, which is very much so a precursor to Cortex in that um, if any of you have seen the iOS control center nowadays, where you can swipe to the left and you have like a little dashboard of widgets you can control. I was essentially trying to make something like that for the iPhone like the year or two years, I guess. It was like 2015 or oh boy, something like that. But uh, right before that update came out. And this was a problem I was tinkering on because I was just fascinated by the fact that all of this data is so hard to organize, yet it's data that you're constantly using throughout your day. You want to know what time your next meeting is, who sent the latest tweet, what the news is. A lot of these simple, repeatable tasks that live on the internet, but you want to quickly access in one place. And it just seemed as though as we move through contexts, this work gets harder to do. And I didn't really know where I wanted to go with that, but I knew that it was somewhere in that information overload realm that I wanted to focus. So as I was getting older and I was actually honing in on my design skills, I was trying to think a little bit more about the actual areas that I wanted to focus on. Um, and as I was getting more into the theory and the design behind what I wanted to build was when things really started to click for me. And uh, 
this is a quote from Jeff Raskin, who is one of my ultimate heroes in the world of uh, design and software. And I think this quote really well encapsulates a lot of what I'm trying to do and a lot of what my internal thesis as a kid was at the time is that, you know, computers really oppress us in that it, it's not that you can't do what you want to on a computer, but it's that a lot of the times there's really only one use case envisioned. So features that we might call intuitive are more so familiar than they are things that we actually gravitate to because as a tool, they help us do what we want to. So as I was continuing to build, I had worked on that project web deck for a couple of years. I gave it up. I was, you know, I had a situation where there was someone who was trying to steal my work. Um, but anyways, I, I, st I stopped that project, but those ideas were still lingering in my mind. And at a certain point I had, you know, worked on that. I had worked with a small ride sharing startup. I wanted to take all these ideas and make something on my own. So I started this idea of a conceptual operating system. This was the first design that I made back in 2017 or 18 for it. And it's just a very simple idea of what if you flip the idea of the desktop paradigm around on its head and instead of having this app centric interface that is focused on you know, the areas in which we were supposed to be working or in which we used to work, we could focus around the types of interactions that are very central to the way that we do work today. So, you know, this example is what if your homepage, the first view that you saw was just a simple dashboard of, you know, your mail, your calendar, what you were working on, and maybe some content that, you know, falls within your activity stream. And as I was continuing to think more and more down this line, I was looking into different interface paradigms that I thought we could flip on our head and again, make these simple tasks simple. And at the time, I really only chose the operating system because I thought that it was a system large enough that it could really change the way that we work. But I know that in essence, working with a kernel is extremely difficult, building, you know, building around any of these operating systems and, and actually implementing that design is really a hassle but this had me thinking in the, in the right direction and I hadn't done as much exploration in I guess the ergonomics behind how my products worked as I had done in systems architecture before. At a certain point though I realized that the operating system wasn't really the right realm for me you know because I wanted to prototype things and there's only a certain amount that I can prototype that wasn't just I'll make this in Figma and then I'll code it out in an HTML environment so I was really at a crossroad of what to do. And I kept doing more and more research, just trying to figure out, okay, I don't really know what this system is going to end up on, but I know that the system is something that needs to be created from an architectural perspective. So I was thinking, okay, maybe the browser is a better place to focus on because you don't have to worry about the kernel. You know, most of the work you're doing is already in the browser. We're not as drawn to the app paradigm that operating systems have, have continued for all of these decades. So I tried building, um, which I'll show later, but some of these screenshots are from a demo that I made in Electron of a browser where I thought, you know, instead of having tabs, what if you were able to scroll horizontally through these different groupings almost of websites? And then from there, you can you know, create a group for each task, you scroll horizontally, so you're not doing as much context switching and then you can be done with whatever you want to, well, done with whatever you want to do, return to your life. Um, and, and that was a great idea and concept, but as I continued to build out a lot of these browser technologies, there were just a lot of issues of limitations of what I could do with a browser extension, limitations of what I could do with Electron's internal technologies. And again, I was at this crossroad where I thought that I knew what the, the, the grand structure would be, but not necessarily how it was going to be implemented. But one thing really changed it all for me during quarantine, and that was a tool which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Rome Research. Um, so, so for those of you who might not, the, my quick 20 second intro to Rome is that in Rome, you have a note for each day. And as you work throughout Rome, if you take notes for what you're doing in the day or what content you're interacting with, and you create backlinks for the individual concept referenced in your notes, then you can have this very rich graph that is giving you context 
and edge cases behind the work that you're doing, the information that you're taking in to strengthen your knowledge. And you can use command line tools that are built into Roam to uh, query and better find content. You can even use it to practice spaced repetition and build upon your thought. Um, but what really captivated me about Rome was that it was able to structure my own thinking personally. Because whenever I spoke to people about this project who didn't really know about all of the interworkings, it'd be like, you know, this is really crazy what you're working on. I have, I have no idea what this system is. Why are you building an operating system? You know, the, the amount of questions I could get, I couldn't, you know, hold on a piece of paper. <laughs> um, but Rome, what I loved about it was that if I was actually able to write down everything behind every design that I was making, every meeting that I had, every article that I was reading, every piece of code that I was writing, then I have this really rich graph of context that I'm able to use to better understand what and why I'm doing something. So even if I might have this really complex process of I need to you know, organize like my internal structure, but then I also need to organize how the app is going to work, you know, it might be very difficult for me to organize all those different contexts, but at least it's in one place instead of, you know, some notes and then some browser tabs and maybe something on a, on a sticky note, um, you know, being able to structure it and also not just, you know, I think the big difference is also, it's not like I'm using like a markdown and I just have like one page notes for my day. I think that the idea of Rome having nested bullets was very important because then those nested bullets can actually represent logic and you can really get down to the minute detail of why you make a certain decision so even though de the decision you make is still very subjective you understand why you are and you can actually build upon that logic instead of being like i came to this conclusion once with this research but it's not going towards anything else in the future so as i was using rome what really struck me is that it's not just rome the tool but it's rome the community that makes this tool so amazing and that at the beginning rome did have early adopters but it didn't have nearly as much power as it does now without all of the use cases that people have adopted rome for you know using rome as um, a professor using rome as a doctor using rome i've even seen people using it you know as an actor in your personal life or um to you know, keep in touch with people. Or there's so many different use cases, but because there is a tool that allows you to have so much extensibility over your thought and over that way that that thought is interconnected, people really gravitated to it. And having that network of people to talk to about it really helped me see that it wasn't the fact that you were able to have all of these notes in one place that was important, but it was really the interlinking aspect of it in Rome as a graph database that I saw as the true potential for the future. So as I was using this tool to structure my own thinking, oh, that's the next slide. As I was using the tool, ooh, I did not mean to go that far, but as I was using the tool to structure my own thinking, I, I was thinking of these things in the background and what I was really thinking myself was that a lot of what I was trying to solve in this hypothetical system, which, you know, the name varied multiple times, um, was really what I was seeing as main issues in Rome in that being able to make your graph portable, being able to reuse that context without losing your place in a note, um, being able to link that context to other places that it might appear online. These are all issues that really I wanted to solve at a grander scale for your entire workflow and not just the notes that you're taking because I don't think that a tool like Rome could just make everyone a note taker and then every single person would log their entire day. I just think that the concept of being able to link things and using that context to power the work that you're doing is what's really important. So I, I, I kept keeping this in the back of my mind and I was designing um, but really the one thing that this helped me change was I wanted to think in these trails. I, I was looking back on some of the research that I had done about our exploration process and about actual research as a part of the interface. And what I was looking back on was this model of berry picking searching that I tried to highlight in this article that I wrote called Tools for Action in that 
the way that we search is is not a, a one step process of you know I want to find uh, these terms or I want to find this exact concept and then there's one document there's one final result that I want. The berry picking method, which is what we innately follow as humans, is you search for something. There's surrounding context that you take in, and then you make a decision based on that, and that guides what you're going to do next. And we're making these decisions constantly, quickly. We're making them across devices. We're making them across context. We're making them as we're speaking to people. But in an information overflow perspective, it's a lot of these small decisions that are choosing, that are helping us choose what content we want to view, but our browsers make it very hard for us to track that when everything is this common um, data structure of a tab or a website. And what I wanted to do was instead think in the actual trails and rabbit holes that will go down. So instead of thinking of, I will group a task or, or an effort, I was thinking about these open-ended trail structures and you know how often, how, what can you intercept in a search query? What can you intercept in work that is going on other places? Are, are there other forms of micro inquiry and micro thought that can take place that aren't as uh, structured and hard to organize as a Rome graph is? And as I was continuing to think about this, um, I was also thinking about what this would mean in terms of different interfaces. As I was talking about a graph database powering this and not just being the interface I was trying to take this trail structure very literally. And um, one design that I have is if you, if you think about a trail as kind of like a, a road or, you know, kind of the way that a, a story goes or the way that a line of inquiry goes, can you follow that trail the same way that you can, you know, follow a, a trail in like a, a choose your own adventure game? And can you go back and see that? Can you, can you follow your steps and retrace the context around it? Or in a group setting, can you work on trails with other people? And can you explore the alternate trails that someone maybe missed or the trails that are adjacent to the domain that you might be searching, but because you didn't see this alternate domain, you can explore the actual steps that someone else has went down instead of you know, being like, Google thought this was 80% near the, the subject that you're uh, searching. So, I was taking this, this trail concept and trying to design an interface around it of just very minimal interactions, you know, moving through content without actually having to focus that much around what, what's wrapped around it, what organizes it. And then as I started to talk with Rome Colt more, I was thinking about, okay, I have this, this idea of trails, but Am I going to build another like standalone out of this? You know, what exactly am I going to do with this? And at this time, I also happened to be talking with someone who was working in the semantic web space and was potentially looking to actually aqua hire the work that I was doing. And for several reasons, it didn't work out. Um, but I realized that I didn't really need to give a whole rebranding to the project but I just needed to stop starting so large and go back to my roots of what is the actual problem. And it seems so dumb because like this is a pitfall that I've had so many times in this project now of just realizing I'm you know, really over my head in this and need to start with much uh, smaller trackable goals. Um, but I was looking at the work that I've done and the work surrounding Rome and I just thought, well, what if I just started building directly on Rome first? What if I start talking to users and understanding if Rome is this, this prototype that I talk about, or I talk about building in terms of Rome or on top of Rome, you know, what can I do? Are there problems with users' workflows that I can solve directly? Is there something that I can build that is adjacent, that is inspired by it? So I just started connecting more with the community. I had been following you know, tech Twitter for a while and especially more so because of the rise of Rome, but I wasn't actually as tuned into talking and, and having these conversations. So I was just trying to have more conversations. And when I see someone like Giori tweets or someone like Boris tweets, I just try and respond and, you know, 
and, and get the carnival going and, and this whole, um, I guess some people will call it building in public, but it, I was really just like sharing what, what you think is interesting, you know? I think that uh, using Twitter as a platform for that has, has really brought a lot of amazing things to this, this project in that um, it's, it's not just, this is a community that I'm going to learn from, but this is a community that I'm going to uh, build, you know, in tandem with. And uh, it's, it's, it's definitely brought a bunch of uh, incredible opportunities over the past couple months, but it really also helped me understand the trajectory of where I want to go in terms of building this. So as I was trying to understand where I wanted to go, I thought, okay, what I'll do first is I'll try and test out some of these features that otherwise would be generally applied to the workflow and apply them just to problems that Roam users are having. Because I know that in the grand scheme of things, what I wanna do is really replacing a lot of systems thinking in a way that, that we work very generally. And when I try and pitch that to people, a lot of the times they're like, oh, well, you're not really solving a problem. You're solving you know, multiple, what, what are you trying to do here? And, and part of it is just my frustration of hearing that and sighing, you know, putting my hand in my face and whatnot. But at a certain point, I thought, okay, well, let me take a step back and think about what they're saying here. I, I totally understand why they would be making that assumption, but it's more so of me realizing I need to show people what the larger proof of concept is, even if those tools don't fully exist yet. So even though this is a very small and niche community, I know that I can give the best demo or the demo that feels the most like magic if it's built on top of Rome and it's utilizing all of these tools. So it's been a blessing and a curse in that I'm, I've been able to realize a lot more about the project, but I think that also very much so narrows down um, how you wanna go about building it. Um, but either way, you know, it, it's been amazing for me and uh, what I've been doing over the past month or two is I've been building this Chrome extension called Graph Portability on top of Rome. And um, I would have loved to show it, but I'm in a little bit of a war right now with the Chrome Web Store um, because essentially in order to get Fission running in the background, I needed to write this little hack where the redirect URL would go like from one of my personal websites and then send back to the Chrome extension because the Chrome extension runs on a local URL of like Chrome slash extension dot dot. And I need to like grab that link and then redirect it. And in order to do that, I'm you know doing a bunch of things behind the scenes that Chrome would otherwise flag for a bunch of uh, odd errors. So I need to make sure that they're not uh, stopping the extension from running or from taking forever to load. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to get that out very soon. But what, what that's doing first is it's syncing the notes that you take with Rome with the websites that you're viewing in Chrome so that you have a better understanding of the actual trails of action that you're taking. So you might be using Rome to write your notes and you know write down, I wanna go look at these docs or view this person's website or I'm stuck on this problem. And then you're gonna go search that thing in Google or find the context. Well, a lot of the times those processors are very interconnected. It might take you a long time to link the website or you know, do something very simple like that. So what if there is a tool that while you're working, you're able to stop and just see, you know, how does the work that I'm doing throughout the day interrelate? Or how am I chunking work? How am I thinking about what I'm doing? And then as I continue to populate this knowledge graph, I can build more tools that are injected into the user's workflow that help them stop and, and gain that context without being submerged in a million tasks or a million different context switching in applications. But I think that um, in the future, there is definitely a shift that I wanna make very soon from Rome in that although I know that there's a lot that I have learned from the tool, my goal is to build this standalone app and that it's, you know, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit different. But as I have I've gotten to this point and building the extension and kind of preparing for building this uh, standalone desktop application, I've gotten a better understanding of sort of what I, what I think the problem and solution is for this tool, even though there is not one concrete thing that I am solving. And I, I think it's this, this really simple task of you know, the tools that we're using lack focus. And when you're on, in a browser 
the simple fact that you have to switch tabs makes it really hard to focus on what you're viewing. Even inside of an application, the way the content is organized makes it very difficult for you to find it. And what makes it really difficult is that the paradigms that we've set out to organize all the different tasks and different you know, types of interactions that we wanna have, have really been blurred in that what used to be a desktop application or a web application is no more if you can simultaneously have both or if you can wrap everything that you're doing inside of an Electron application you know, and, and ship it to Mac, Windows, and Linux all in one go. And what I'm trying to solve is, you know, not just at a level of this Facebook ad is distracting me or something, but how can we actually create focus without losing that ability to multitask? And when I mean multitask, I do not mean multi-focus. You know, I, I classify multitasking as these small interlinking tasks that, that give you the context for the larger umbrella. You know, the multitasking might be you're, you're grabbing the file, you're, you're searching for the information, you're kind of pulling it all together into this space where you can analyze. You should not have to be doing all that work if the information is all there. So really what I'm trying to have Cortex focus on is creating focus in two main ways. So the first way is organizing all of the searches and sites that you're viewing into a trail. So you can kind of view them like a Twitter thread and see the ways in, in which your action is changing over time. But the second way in which I'm trying to do this is connecting to apps directly so that you can create commands using natural language to interface with actual information instead of having to go on each website, click through A, B, C, and D, export content, you know, share it with other people. If there are primitives that belong to you as a user on the internet, then you should be able to reference those primitives wherever you're working independent of an app structure. And I think that a big part of that is being able to automate a lot of these little tasks where, you know, Let's say that, for example, you have data in a Google spreadsheet that you're collecting and you want to like, I don't know, you want to like send it to Airtable and then you want to send out emails to people based upon it. You know, th this task that's like, it's not one task that is going to like run forever in the background, like a Zapier or an IFTTT. You know, it's a task that, um, that is very repeatable, that can happen multiple times, that only has one use case. If you were to go about doing this, you'd have to go and export the data and import it and make sure that all the cells are properly formatted and that your contacts you know, have an Airtable account and whatnot, a lot of these steps. Whereas if the data are stored more so as primitives and you can see the ways in which they're related, you, know, you could actually do what you want with that content instead of focusing on what the system around you allows you to do with it. So I, I know that this is um, a very big feat, but I think that being able to change the way that we interact with content so that a lot of these small tasks are automated and a lot of these tasks that really require our attention, like you know, reading something or, or creating content, these things that really require us to view things through all of these different lenses, we want as much focus as we can as, as possible at that moment. We want to be able to view all of the alternate lenses that we don't get to see as you know single-minded human beings and in order to do that we can't keep thinking in the way that we always have we need to really push the paradigm forward and i i know that there are not a lot of large systems that are able to do this right now but i just feel that if no one else is going to try it from a systems perspective like this then you know why not uh why not give it a crack you know and a lot of the work that I've been doing really has, has been centered around this main thesis that in order to get these large things done, like create a web three or create better consumer tools or something, you know, we don't need to create a new exo web and then, and then port all of our tools and make a, a decentralized Google clone and a decentralized Reddit clone and get everyone to copy over. You know, there needs to be a middleman, a layer between the old and the new. And if you look between history, this is very true. And any time that there is a change happening, you cannot kind of just replace the new on top of society. You need this, this bridge between the both. And I think that in order to do that, we, we don't need a whole set of new primitives. We, we don't need all of these new things. You know, we are able to interface with, with what already exists you know, and, and, and still build something new and still push the needle forward. And um, that is, is really what I'm trying to do with this tool. And I, I, yeah, again, I know, I know that it is not 
an easy feat, but I think that it's so important to the way that we're interacting with content and that I know that for you know some other tools in this space, the focus might be, we want to democratize note taking. We want to make an open sourced Rome. We want to, you know, I, th I think a lot of the times with these tools, the goals are very much so let's democratize the standards and let's democratize the platform. And I think that that is a first step. You have to obviously think that way, you know, you, you can't just end up at the end goal. But I think that where I am thinking right now, even though I'm focused on the now is I'm thinking, you know, tend to to 20 years down the line when I don't actually have to be just building for a desktop and, you know, you can interface more with nature. And I think that, you know, really thinking that way right now is enabling me to focus on the values behind this and the, the broader implications and all of the partnerships that I can be having with, you know, with other projects or with having different parts of the technology open source potentially. Um, and and you know, I think for that reason, it's just a really exciting time to, to be building in this space. And um, you know, I, I can't be more excited. Um, so I guess what's next for me is a couple things. So I am trying to raise right now because after working on this for three years, I have kind of hit a wall where the technology that I want to build, I can't fully build on my own. And that, you know, this whole bunch of machine learning and uh, natural language stuff that is just at the scale of a, a larger company. And I, I need some capital in order to hire more developers. So that is one thing that I'm doing. I'm trying to launch this extension once I can get the Chrome Web Store off my back. <laughs> and then I'm also um, working on this standalone desktop application, which originally was going to be an Electron, but since I've actually migrated to Swift UI which was a very, it took me a long time to make that decision because obviously compatibility is a huge key. Um, but I just think that for multiple reasons, you know, because of the stack and the internal APIs, but also because of Apple being a platform where users are really expecting that, that high functioning performance of an application where I can, I can focus on that and getting that experience more and not have to worry about persistence and, and memory management and, and all that load and, and let Apple take care of it for me for the most part. Um, so, so that's where I'm heading. And, um, you know, that's most of what, what I've been working on. Um, I know I'm a little bit under, under time, but I do have a demo that I would love to show. And then from there, I've been seeing a bunch of stuff pop up in this chat. So I'd love to open it up to a question from there. But beforehand, I'll give you a very quick demo of uh, Cortex. So this is a demo that I made actually exactly about a year ago. So this was right before I started using Roam. Um, this was the screenshots were up there somewhere, but the main focus was being able to scroll horizontally through groups of tabs and then making simple tasks in a browsing environment a lot more simple. So the first one was, you know, instead of having a username and password, um, can you have a magic link that signs you in? So here I'll have to grab my phone to click the link real quick. Um, but, you know, this, this is one of the main things of, even though theoretically you wouldn't need to log in in a browser, I, I just think if you're going to include something like auth, thinking about a lot of these small features is, is really how I'm, I'm trying to think about usability. So the way that you would go about using this is I'll type in a link like a Google and it'll show up, uh, type in my website. And right now it's really only taking like anything that fits in the URL constructor. But as you type in these links, uh, Amazon, uh, you just scroll horizontally through them and you can rename this grouping. So, you know, vision demo browsing, or if I wanted to, I can even create a little tag um, so that I can go back and reference them. Or if I want to view my website, you know, larger, I could view it in full screen here. Um, so, you know, this is definitely very minimal in use, but being able to actually scroll through the sites horizontally and play around with this thing, I think was just kind of nice for me. And then uh, if you go back to the home page here, you just have all these different groups of the tabs that you were working with. So my goal is that if I can kind of take a, the technology like this and apply it to what I'm using now, then I have a much larger stack of uh, web tools to use. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's most of um, what I have to demo and, and what I've been working on. And um, oh, I saw someone just put reminds me of Mercury OS. 
Yes. So um, I guess we'll just start the comments and questions there. So Mercury OS actually was. Hang on, hang on. We at the oh, very sorry, least sorry. we have to give you a round of applause here, Dylan. Uh, that okay. was uh, <laughs> like my brain is smoking a little bit. Uh, so that's that's awesome. Um, take it Thank away, you, Mercury you. OS. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. All I was gonna say about Mercury was. Um, so it came out when the project was still an operating system. It was called like Universal OS at the time. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I saw this. I saw this pop up one day, and I tried reaching out to the, the founder Jason Un multiple times, and you know, unfortunately, never heard anything uh, back. But it was a huge inspiration, and one main reason was it led me to read the Humane Interface, which is Jeff Raskin's book, which is, I think, by and large, the largest uh, design inspiration that I've ever received. So that project is a huge inspiration. And that's definitely the line of thinking that I wanna take this down in terms of being able to direct interactively with content where it doesn't make sense to have the full window. And uh, awesome. yeah, I mean, I, I see other, others pull in here, but if anyone has other questions to bring up, I mean, I guess yeah, I'm kind of so, opening it up now. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to I wanted to pause a little. You you flew through a bunch of stuff. So um, uh, okay. you're in your final year of high school right now. Yes. Yes. Um, and so this is this is kind of your you're looking right now to do this uh, uh, basically to work on Cortex full time yes. um, as a as a funded company. Uh, that's going to be your your post high school task right now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of in a weird gray area where I'm in, in the middle of hearing back from universities, but obviously my main focus is working on this. And I'm really only using that as kind of a catapult to just get out to San Francisco. I'm in New York City currently. Um, so, you know, anything I can do to get out there and just try and meet other people. But yeah, that's my main focus is trying to, you know, work on this full time. I'd say that the pandemic has made it easy for me to work on it practically full time for the past year has really been a ton of, uh, you know, work for me to do at school and such. So that, that's awesome. definitely where I'm trying to take it. But. Uh, and you're working on the Chrome extension. Um, uh, you're the first person to do some stuff with Fission and, uh, and Chrome. So that's, that's really great. And, you know, uh, there's only so much we can do in, in fixing how like web standards, like cores and stuff work, but you know, yeah, yeah. And any, any other help you need with that, um, you know, just let us know. Um, Swift UI, same thing. Um, hey, if you, if you want to be uh, one of the first users of some uh, Fission plus Swift UI stuff, that's also stuff that we'd love to help with. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, we're, we, we don't have any native, um, uh, native mobile code yet, but we actually see Fission being a pretty decent you know, user-centric backend uh, that works really well for, for native mobile apps as well. So excited to see where you go with that. Yeah, for um, sure. Uh, and and are you looking for? I, I know uh, I I haven't tried it myself yet. I have the I have the demo information from you. Are you still looking for other people to uh, demo the 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 self installable version of the Chrome extension? Yeah, that'd be awesome. I mean, definitely if you have a Rome graph and you want to use it, um, really all you have to do is just download your Rome JSON and then um, you can upload it. And it's just really simple to start the extension. But you know, in the meantime, while it's not on the App Store, I can. I can send it to you after this. Um, yeah, great, awesome. So we'll we'll make sure to to follow up anyone who uh, um, who signed up for the event for Luma. I'll send that out as the follow up email uh, when we've got the video up and everything. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So do you want to take that question from uh, from Ethan or or comment on that? Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess to the Swift UI point, hopefully it would be for all um, for all platforms. I mean, I think. That's, that's one of the big draws of it is that, you know, seeing people like Twitter and others like build um, from the same code base is that you can, you know, build like iPad, iPhone and desktop all in one. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of still in playing around with it. Mostly I've been looking into seeing how I can work with uh, like WK WebView and basically like wrap that into something I can use in Swift UI. Um, but I, that definitely is my goal is to be able to launch on all three. And then I think Speaking to your other point, Ethan, about repurposing tools. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I totally agree. I've seen a bunch of these decentralization platforms popping up, you know, Fission, but also um, Blockstack and Gun and um, 
dat protocol and a, a beaker browser and a bunch of those other ones and i think that it's obviously amazing that all of this work is going on but one thing that i really take issue with is this idea of people thinking that again we need to like create this exo web or or for all the tools that there needs to you know be some new way of, of reconfiguring them and what i'm really trying to drive home with this tools for action is that maybe instead we need to focus on the software experience and have some sort of common understanding that we're all gonna handle data the same way. I think that what's amazing about Rome isn't just that it's exposed graph databases as a data structure, but that it's bringing together people who really care about the, the quality usage of these tools, being able to get more out of their thinking, out of their workflow. And I think this is gonna give a, a birth to a real revolution of these consumer apps that are built with intentional workflows in mind of not just, you know, this is an app for organizing your entire Scrum, your entire workflow or something, but you know, this is a, a purposeful IDE for designers with you know autocomplete features for, for interactive components, or this is a this is a tool for developers to streamline their workflow, or or this is a tool that um, helps writers generate new ideas. I think that this is gonna again you know give birth to these tools that help us again dive into the individual task that we're doing with more specificity than we're currently able to, and that a tool like a Cortex would be like the middleman between all of these that behind the scenes is helping handle all of these decentralized protocols. So what's really interesting about this, uh, a lot of the, the stuff that you've, you've described actually from the very beginning of your presentation, um, uh, I know I've gone through a bunch of this and I think a lot of the people on the call were nodding their heads as well. Um, I think it was Jury who mentioned Workflowy, which was really interesting and a re revelation. And Workflowy was the thing that I moved to from Evernote, which at the time um, was super interesting. It was amazing. Uh, the Evernote team themselves ended up building um, mini apps for specific purposes. So I got my mom using the uh, recipes um, app that all stored everything in Evernote. So I had this one Evernote graph um, and then specialized apps on top of it. So uh, this feels like uh, some similar themes coming up. Evernote had a, uh, had a number of issues being proprietary, um, not really having an open format um, and, uh, and being just one company and then ultimately deciding to ditch all of their, um, their add-on apps. Um, uh, I was involved with a company that, that actually built a blogging platform on top of Evernote where you could just tag um, uh, an Evernote note with published, and then it would publish it to a to a web front end. So I, I lots of similar themes that are coming up, and I think the I don't know I don't even know if I have guidance in the sense that uh, I think your your intuition is correct that there's a there's a lot of different people who benefit from it. I think Evernote's original focus was journalists and investors as at the time, the like primary um, knowledge workers that they saw really making use of this. And you've listed a whole larger task, like especially during the pandemic, all of us are, many of us are fully virtual knowledge workers. Yeah, and I think, I think part of that is that um, I'm not really trying to target knowledge workers because I want this to be very note heavy at first. I'm like, Cortex itself right now doesn't have native note taking tools, although that is something I've been thinking about a lot for the future. But I think it's that using a tool like Rome helped me understand why notes and then the context surrounding them, if used in the proper way, are super important. And that I think that using knowledge workers as a term has helped me encapsulate an audience of people who are just more focused on really organizing their thinking, their thought process, and information in general. And that beforehand where it was just journalists and investors, I think now you have a whole new sector of, you might have some people who are just general enthusiasts, but they work in other areas. And some people who are really using these tools for more like self-improvement, self-caring type of things. Um, but I, you know, I think that in general, what I wanna do is take the style of craft that a tool like this has shown. And I think by craft, I just mean like 
data being extensible and that, you know, in Rome, for example, every single block is something that you are able to move around. You know, every block you're able to query, for example, I think being able to work with data at such a high specificity is, is super important. And uh, I just saw another comment come in there from Mark Antoine. Is that something you wanted to elaborate on? Please. Um, yeah, no, uh, I'm on the journey, sim on a similar journey. Uh, I'm very much trying to think about ways to have interoperability between different ways of representing not just graph, but hypergraph data. Uh, and for example, when you speak of UX, like I would, I'm very interested in very responsive UX and, you know, subscribing to, but that means that the data has to be consumed as events. So it's a different yeah. model uh, yeah. than data as these little blocks. And if you want to have an ecosystem of plugins that either transform, con you know, subscribe to produce data in a continuous flux, um, it does require be able, being able to refer to any piece of data in any data stack, in any data environment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, that's obviously not trivial, right? Uh, URLs only go so far, uh, but though I believe uh, uh, some URLs don't go farther than most people realize, mind you. Uh, not all URLs is HTTP. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think like along that same line is like we need something like the atom of the internet, and in that beforehand it was it was a file, but we yeah, don't really exactly. have to, you know exactly you exactly. And 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 some atoms are events, and some people don't work with events, so sometimes at the atom is a little data blob which is connected to other things. And then what are its data change affordances? If we're going to do interoperable operations, we need to know, okay, what can I do to this data blob in its native data environment? Yeah. Um, and, and again, identity, you, you, you're touching a lot of the main points, right? I mean, uh, I have this identities and permission on each of those little, little blobs of data in each of those silo, but it's a different account in each of those silos. How can I put them together? But when we're building this generic UX that can make all these things work together, it does mean universal data reference, universal data transformation, universal data events. Uh, and, and, and this way of transforming between the specific ones and the generic ones and translation is extremely important. Hence all the work on data, I think. Uh, yes, yeah. th they're not separable. <laughs> no, ex exactly, I, I agree. And I think that what's really difficult as well is that like a lot of these tools allow you to do a lot of the same things, but it's because the ontology or the use case is very slightly shifted it's very yep. difficult for you to actually organize a lot of those unless you have a very sophisticated model or something that's scraping that together. So, exactly. that, you know, that's another, that's another issue I've been wrestling with. And there's a whole stream of them. But I, th you know, I think the way that I've been trying to do this is just trying to think about like the direction of where some of these, these stacks are able to go so that as the, the IPFSs of the world kind of find their own place that I'm able to adapt to wherever things go and that I don't have, you know, I don't have to have people adopt a standard in that. I think that's why a lot of the, the semantic web stuff failed very early on is that people don't want to have to organize their entire code into RDF and Sparkle queries. And, you know, even look today, this is something that uh, Tim Berners-Lee has been championing for 25 years, but it's really only over this the past, like, three to five years that I've even, you know, seen JSON LD have a spike on the internet where now um, if you see there are these, um, these Google snippets where if there's a recipe or an article, it will give like the preview and that's all JSON LD, which is, you know, crazy. Yeah, so well, JSON LD has done a lot to bring RDF back uh, and RDF has a lot of limitations, but with RDF star, we're breaking some of those. I think we can go much further. Uh, I certainly think that there's much more promise there with this hybrid data. And it's too bad that, X I mean, XML had a lot of flaws, but the mixing of data and text, I think was extremely important. And for me, Rome goes too far on the text side and we lost the data capability. Like every, yeah. uh, 
identity in Rome has to be readable text, and I think that's wrong <laughs> because yeah. not every not everything is readable text. Uh, on the other hand, um, I mean, some identifiers are complex or need context. Yeah, but and I, I, and I yeah. Go on. Sorry, I was just gonna say that I think what's crazy too is that we talk about all of these linguistic issues with Rome when their main focus is Rome as a data structure and as like an interlinking database. And it's not even like, let's make like the best functioning note-taking tool, or at least that's not like the main yeah. focus, at least with the Rome render and Rome in turn everything. But uh, you know, I, I totally agree. I, and, uh, I, think, I think some of this stuff ends up being, um, you know, and we've got a group here who could who could go into any one of these rabbit holes for for a long period of time, right? So we're 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 talking about a lot of different layers here. Um, I think um, you know some of our own experience at Fission. Um, so IPFS as an example, we see it as a protocol. We see it as a really awesome protocol. Um, we see it as a really great commons network, uh, which is a term that I'm still working through. Of uh, we don't really think about. HTTP being a network anymore because it's it's so distributed and just baked in everything speaks HTTP, uh, which is which is great um, for us with IPFS. We know that we're leaning into a protocol where the protocol has certain features. Yay, great! There's something at the protocol level that we can agree on, right? Um, including attributes like content addressing, which we know make things very very portable. Um, and including things of, of its commons network nature, where Fission has to run infrastructure to make stuff work today. Um, but realistically, um, anyone can stick a Raspberry Pi or their phone um, and, and content kind of remains available. But that's a layer, you know, to your point, Dylan, people mostly shouldn't have to care about that layer. Like if, if you as an app developer switch from um, MySQL to Postgres to Redis, who cares, right? That um, other than the cap other than to Mark Antoine's point, like what are the capabilities that those things possibly bring, and what are the like trade offs of them, sort of sort of thing, right? So that's that's one. Um, so then our next challenge becomes, um, which components can we rely on <laughs> to work? Um, so when I say like, oh yeah, it's a commons network, it just works. The team at Vision has done a ton of stuff to make the IPFS protocol like work in a browser and from an infrastructure perspective and other stuff like that. And the challenge that we ended up going on, we said, okay, that you can't do private content. And we're like, okay, you know, we should work on having private and encrypted content. And then it took us a year <laughs> to build an identity system, um, a way of doing decentralized authentication, uh, designing an encrypted file system on top of IPFS, uh, and making it all work in a browser, right? So it's, it's a similar sort of story where you're like, okay, well, I'll just do this. And you realize to like get to the layer you want to get to, if the other components aren't there, you have to build them yourself. And I think that's our joint challenge of can we now start finding composable building blocks from protocol to chunks of code to libraries to even concepts, right? We haven't focused on atoms within Fission really yet at all, uh, other than I'd say apps maybe, um, but, that, but that is a very, very large atom. Um, so Dylan, can you maybe talk about like, what do you think is the thing that you would love to just grab off the shelf and be like, I wish I had capability X or I wish Y just worked today. Any thoughts on that? I wish like, I wish I had X capability in terms of like the whole Adams conversation, you mean? Anything, if, if, if you're thinking of this stuff that is gonna be your life's work of, of trying to make some of this stuff work, which solid foundations do you wish were further along or just worked or could you see being worked on? Yeah, I mean, I think that really where I want my focus to lie like right now is in like, as you just said, like making these simple tasks simple and that a lot of this work of like working, like I think the Redis um, and Postgres 
example was spot on Boris of like, it doesn't really matter what is going on behind the scene. Like if you have this data that lives somewhere, you should be able to share it in all of these different contexts and across all of these different platforms. And the fact that we as humans are able to take that input in and reorganize it, but our machines aren't able to, and yet they're able to do, you know, like beat us at chess, for example. Like, I think that's kind of crazy. Like, we need to level the playing field so that technology can help us do these simple things with exponentially higher output than we're used to before we start, you know, working on like rocket science or any, any of the crazy problems. So I think that is really what I want to, to line my focus on first. And I think if this were a simple problem, again, it would have been solved 20, 30, or even more years ago. Um, but you know, this is something that we're, we're still iterating on today. So I think that the main work is in you know, trying to both make like the, I guess, consumer interface of how a lot of this is interacting with, but then also the technologies and open standards that allow all these things to talk and then allow whichever tools and protocols end up at the top, if that is something like an IPFS to remain where they are. Okay, so I'm going to try and spit this back to you. Uh, and Jerry, I've, I've got you. So what you're saying is you want to work on machine contextualization of data so that it can help humans more automatically supercharge their their data and flows is that yes. a fair statement yes that is a very that is possibly the most succinct way of organizing it for us. <laughs> um, okay so a really small task is what you're saying great okay awesome yeah yeah it's like minute yeah yeah um, but I think it's like that kind of like assisted intelligence, or I think I even saw someone on Twitter the other day say like, I think assisted introspection was, was the, uh, the category. But I think uh, this, this, this field of getting those simple tasks done more quickly, but then also having a simple task as a part of our workflow being this task of understanding and that it's, it's not really up to the computer to be guiding our thinking, but it's up to the computer to actually be representing these models in the most succinct you know, and thorough ways as possible. And before we can go ahead and build on top of that, we need to at least have those, those tools present. So I think once we can reach a point where our software is extensible as possible, you can really you know, do anything across all devices with your content. You can like create your own little scripts or commands, whatever then in the future, we'll be focusing more on the hardware and the way that you actually interact with this content, you know, instead of like having a, a black box rectangular de uh, device that sits in your pocket, you know, finding different ways to interact with your content in nature is, is really where I wanna. Right, right. I, I caught that thing half. where you're, you're gonna build the, um, the augmented reality interface uh, as, uh, as step two of your Swift UI, right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I know. I know. Everybody on this call is probably thinking about when the Apple glasses come out, especially with uh, lots of these. Oh already. boy! Do you uh, do, do do people know about this company, Humane? Yeah, that's that's what kind of scares me, to be honest. That's what I because. I, okay, so I don't know how much people know about it, but like the basically you would be wearing this like lapel that looks like an Apple Watch on your waist and it has a LiDAR sensor and a camera. So if you want to make a phone call, it will project a phone like interface onto your hand with a radar and you just tap on your hand. But then at the same time, it will be capturing memories and content around you. So you can be walking on the street and be like, what's that building ahead of me? And it will run AI to like check the building, check the companies in it. And it will be like, this is the Flatiron building. And like these companies work in it. And this is the activity that's happened there. Or, you know, going even more freaky, you can, you can do something like uh, show me my conversation with my friend yesterday. And you can like sit back and like watch the tape. Like uh, that movie Click with Adam Sandler where he is the remote. So you know? for, the, for those that, that, that don't know freaky. that. I, I actually ran a product studio for a couple of years focused on wearables in AR that was called human. Um, and uh, we, uh, I should, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look for the videos, but we actually did some early prototypes um, with um, hand-based 
uh, just using hands and, and vision to do uh, to do UIs like very very basic. We actually like made a reflector and stuck an iPhone in it uh, because we were trying to build it on top of mobile devices rather than step one being spend three thousand dollars on hardware. So yeah. um, I think it's a good point. Is all of this is is coming? I certainly you know to your question, I have been I've been looking for. Um, enhanced understanding as a service for 20 years, my 20 plus years of blogging and putting content together where, um, you know, we've had, uh, I think uh, the Mac, uh, Mac OS has actually had a long history of people building tools that have a usable UI on top of them that run on the Mac. Um, I'm trying to think of the one, um, it's pretty old these days that uh, to look it up afterwards that you could interconnect everything in your operating system um, oh, so I think is that like Alfred? I don't know. Is, has has similar capabilities. Maybe yeah. you're thinking more. Yeah, on the machine. Uh, yeah, it does a bunch more stuff than 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 this. It was uh, it had a bunch of RDF and semantics in it as well. Uh, oh, Jury, you had a question. Please go ahead. Join the join the conversation. You're muted. I done this in two. 2012, uh, Android with, with WebView, and underneath uh, probably 2000 line program, which basically a web server and a graph database. Now, if you do that on any platform and make it compatible with Fission, then that's it. You can, you can lift your app into the, back into the over web. Okay, because that's what Fission, the, the whole point is web native is that, that Everything is okay behind the glass, but is is one link away. Think about that. And if you make, which I've done, if you make uh, interpersonal communication possible, powered by fission and OBDB, then you, you can really you can really build a new web. And of course, making it all compatible with the existing centralized, federated, indie web, whatever. Those who poor souls who still use servers. And of course, there are some cases where you need it and it makes sense. Okay. Uh, I think Matthias said the other day uh, uh, that you have, uh, you have your data in front of the firewall. That's what fission can do, you know. <laughs> uh, anyhow, yeah. so, so, I, so I, 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 I read, that was one of the things I wanted to say that, that yes, it actually makes sense. And that, that way, you actually escape the, the, the Apple. Uh, get to. I've done it yeah. for, for Android. That was, and I called it pocket pocket app, pocket uh, cloud apps, because basically then you can actually connect to your iPhone from your browser on the desktop. And once you do that, you know you you can you can still play the web native games. So that's uh, just a suggestion. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I think that's also. I mean, that's one reason why I was hugely drawn to Fission. Um, but I think it's also like this thing of while I definitely do want to run on as many platforms as possible, I think that actually like Fission and Swift UI, like, I don't know, for some reason it happens to make more sense for this individual stack in that I think that for literally any other application that is interacting with the web, that exact stack that you were just talking about fully works. But the main issue is that fundamentally what I want to do is change the way that we're interacting with each website. So that means that maybe only about 30 to 40%, let's say of websites will be statically rendered as a web view and the rest of them, I need to be fetch fetching that content independently. Then I need to be doing some workarounds that I can only be doing in web view because otherwise I would need like a whole process manager. And when I'm like trying to do too much with the Chrome stuff, then it's like overrunning the Chrome uh, like process manager itself. And if I just let Apple do it with machine learning on device, then I don't have to take care of a lot of that like management myself. And I mean, I think also just like the fact that Apple users kind of want like that craft, that craft sense and that if you're using Android, you're used to setting up a workflow for yourself but on an Apple device, I think a lot of the times you expect that out of the box, you're going to have these beautifully designed experiences that will sync on all your devices. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like that, that magic effect 
that I think an Apple user expects. And I think that at least early on, I want to make sure that that's something I'm delivering on. Yeah. I mean, just, I think, just, uh, yeah. Ethan, I've, I've got you as well. I, um, so I think, I think this is a really interesting thing. So Fission's take right now is that as far as cloud tools go, it's up to a developer to have to go out and search out every single bit and piece of thing and integrate it themselves, which is a lot of work like that alone. Yeah. If, you, if you looked at the trail of someone going, I'm going to build an app and then researching all the things that they might possibly use to put it together. So we kind of think we're at like peak individual cloud tool. And so Fission's take is, can we start taking an Apple approach where you have an SDK that has multiple components together um, um, so that because that's the only way that we and the developer can deliver an integrated experience by actually having components that are designed to work together, right? Yeah. And we'll have to extend that over time and so on. It doesn't mean that you can't integrate anything. It's programming. So you can use an API and integrate anything, but are there basic building blocks that everybody needs to build an app and, and from the Apple perspective, can we be opinionated on certain things around the UX, the privacy, the encryption, or or so on, and ideally steering people towards things like shareable and portable data and schemas and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So, uh, and and then the next and then the next level there is kind of the intermediary where you have to be concerned about the semantics of it all without you know, being too nitpicky about how it ends up in the end. So uh, I think that's kind of where I'm trying to find myself is like, um, when, when do I want to open up something? Like, do I want to start working on an open standard now and like have that be what drives the beginning or, you know what I mean? Like really where I've been, where I've been heading is that I would create my own like internal, oh, I think someone's, uh, I would basically create wrappers to connect to apps themselves. And at a certain point, I would just open up the standard and be like, you want to build your app on this standard. And, you know, so I mean, we'll see how that goes though. Ethan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you had a point earlier that I thought was really good. When you were talking about being able to adapt to different frameworks, if they change how the focus isn't, isn't quite on like, here's what framework we're using, but, um, Cortex is trying to enable individual users to use their computers like they want. I realized that talking about democratization is really uh, a really good metaphor for what you're trying to do because democracy requires individuals to be educated. So right now we have like large kind of school systems in one sense and Rome is, is kind of like a community library, but what you're focusing on, it almost seems like tutors for the individual to give them digital literacy, to, to teach them how computers work, to teach them how to use their own computer so that they can use their computer with other people's computers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Like, I think if anyone is, um, oh, I think someone has an echo in there. Oh, perfect. Um, like, I think one metaphor I like to give is uh, Tristan Harris from the Center of Humane Design. I watched him give a talk once where he was basically saying anyone who is, is using an app like a, like a Snapchat, for example, they don't have a goal going into the app. Their goal, because of how much persuasive design has kind of you know, found its way into the inner workings of society, the user's goal has actually become the goal of the product designer. You know, think about Snapchat streaks, for example. It has kind of programmatically made it so that you think that your friendship it, you know, is determined by how many days you are uh, Snapchatting someone back and forth. It wasn't your goal in the first place to be like, you know, I'm going to talk to these people, but now that is synonymous with something that you carry into your life. And I think that before we get to a point where computers are trying to aid us in the, the ways in which we want to think that we just need to, again, like level the playing field and that we spend so much time just trying to discern what is true, trying to find where information is. We spend all of our time with these, these tasks that seem so simple. It seems like information should be handed us and you should be able to read a headline and not have to think, you know, is, is this content that is true? When did this occur? Who did this? But now we're at a point where that sort of social proof of being able to distinguish every minute detail of a fact so that you don't have to, you know, 
all of that is abstracted away. You don't have to worry about that. That's really where we want to be. So I say always that really the mission with Cortex is democratizing knowledge and creation in that it, it's, it's not um, where you're going with it, but it's just, you need the tools to have it and do something with it. And it, if you have the tools and you have the space to analyze them and you're you know, your system isn't uh, pushing you towards a goal that you don't individually want, then you're not going to get what you want out of that content. Uh, I'm going to, uh, we, we don't have to leave right away, but I'm going to stop recording. I'd like one more round of applause for, uh, for Dylan. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to uh, watching you over the next uh, 40 years of you following this along. Uh,